title today is the same as it was the previous two times, and that is the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord, this will be part three, and we'll be looking at verses 6 through 11 of 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Uh, it's, been, it's been a little while ago since I last saw this particular video clip, but it was a YouTube video, and it was a church service. I don't know for sure if it was a Sunday morning church service or when it was, but there's a church service, and all of a sudden, the one who's preaching, he looks over to his left, and he sees a commotion. He, he, he sees someone talking. I don't know if he could hear it, but he saw it. And he calls this person by name and lambasts him. It was embarrassing. I, I'm watching a video clip of something that happened in another part of the country, and it was embarrassing. He, he just berates him. And then he walks down from the pulpit and walks down and he goes beside this person and just speaks in a totally unpastoral way to that person, this person. It, it, was, it was awful. It was embarrassing. That preacher gave preachers a very, very bad name. Now look, do I want people to pay attention and, and stay awake? Now actually, I think I misspoke. He, he was not talking, he was asleep. That's what it was. And so he, he, he woke him up and everything else was as I said it. Do I want people to stay awake when I'm preaching? Sure I do. Do I want you to pay attention? Of course I do. Uh, two or three weeks ago, I was preaching chapel at a Christian school. And I had preached the, uh, the uh, middle school chapel. That one went very, very well. The Lord met with us. It went very well. It was time for the high school chapel. And uh, the one who was leading the chapel, he gave his same instruction to the high schoolers as he gave to the middle schoolers. Now, you know here at this Christian academy, we, we pay attention to the word. I expect you to do this, whether it's a guest speaker or not. And so I came up, and I'm going to tell you, I mean, from the get-go, at about my 11 o'clock, there was a young guy. And my, my hunch is he's a stud athlete. He had on his jacket that showed that they were having a basketball game today, and he's, he's one of the probably the best players on the team. I just kind of got that. In the, man, he is talking to his guy beside him, and they're just talking, talking, talking. Now, I did not look at him. I didn't know his name, so I wouldn't tempt me to call him by name, but I just said, now, hold on, hold on a minute. Now, some, somebody in here is not paying the kind of attention that you know you ought to pay. You were just told to pay attention. I said, this is not about me. It's about this book, and you should, you should pay it. And, and to his credit, he did. He, he sat straight up, and I think he paid pretty good attention from the rest of the time on. I say all that to say this. Yes, I do want you to stay awake while I'm preaching and teaching. But more importantly than you staying awake during a church service is you being awake and alive of what's going on in the world. You can sleep during a service, and there can be any number of reasons that can happen. I mean, some people, they come up to me every now and then, and they apologize. You know, Brother Jeff, I'm sorry that I, I dosed off on you today, but, and, and they're on medication, and they, they can't help it. They're, they're, they're trying their best to stay awake, and the medication, I, I understand that. I'm not offended by that. But far more importantly is for us to be awake, as it were, in our walk with Christ. Somebody could sit up as spry as possible and pay every attention to every word I say and regurgitate it back to me afterwards and yet be dead and asleep to the things of God in reality. So when we come to this particular passage, Keith Green um, I'm, I'm going to get to a song that he wrote that has lyrics that I think kind of uh, point to some of the truths in this passage. I don't know if Keith Green, if that name rings a bell for you, but he was a pre-teen heartthrob. He signed a rock and roll contract with Decca Records back in 1965, and that was when he was 12 years old. At age 12, he has signed a record deal. By age 12, he had already written 40 original songs. He came from a Jewish family, 
And then as a teenager, he came to faith in Jesus. And then his music changed. The lyrics changed. Instead of writing for the world, he wrote for the church. He wrote to honor the Lord. He and his wife, Melody, started Last Day Ministries. Keith and two of his children were tragically killed in a plane crash back in 1982. It's almost like he was a musical prophet. He wrote a song that was released back in 1978. It was entitled, Asleep in the Night. It was a wake-up call to the church. Listen to the lyrics and see if you agree. Some of the lyrics go like this. Do you see, do you see all the people sinking down? Don't you care? Don't you care? Are you going to let them drown? How can you be so numb not to care if they come? You close your eyes and pretend the job's done. Can't you see it's just a sin? The world is sleeping in the dark and the church just can't fight because it's asleep in the night. How can you be so dead when you've been so well fed? Jesus rose from the grave and you, you can't even get out of bed. Jesus rose from the dead. Come on, get out of your bed. I do not know if he had 1 Thessalonians 5 in mind when he wrote those lyrics, but as we're going to read in a few moments, you can certainly see the parallel between them. Keith Green there speaks metaphorically, and in his song he says, the church is asleep, and therefore get out of your bed. Such metaphorical language is exactly the kind of language that Paul uses here in 1 Thessalonians 5. Now, if you've been here recently, you know that our text is about the day of the Lord. And the scriptures make reference to the day of the Lord, both in the Old Testament and the New Testament. And can I remind you one more time, the day of the Lord is not a 24-hour period of time. There are certain places in Scripture where a day is certainly a 24-hour period of time. But in the context, we know that the day of the Lord cannot be something that is only 24 hours long. It, it covers a period of time. And most conservative Bible scholars think that the day of the Lord cover, begins at the rapture. It covers the tribulation. It covers the millennial reign. Of, it goes all the way until the establishment of the new heaven and the new earth. And so there is a component of the day of the Lord that will be dramatic and it will be dreadful because God's wrath will be poured out on unbelievers. But there's also a component that is going to be delightful for God's people because the day of the Lord has to take place before the church, the body of Christ, can experience its full salvation. And so the day of the Lord in verse 2 is referenced, for you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. This certain coming of the day of the Lord should motivate us to live in line with who we are. And so, therefore, verses 4 and 5, but you are not in darkness, that is spiritual darkness, brothers, that that day should surprise you like a thief. For you are all children of light, spiritual light, children of the day. We are not of the night or of the darkness. We are followers of Christ who said, I am the light of the world. And therefore, we are to live our lives in light of the light of truth from God's word. Our position is in Christ. And that position requires action. And so my purpose in preaching this morning is to share with you three Christian responses to the day of the Lord. Three Christian responses to the day of the Lord Part of this will be a quick review from last week, and then some of it obviously will be new material. First, stay engaged in the battle. In light of the day of the Lord, one of the first responses for us is to stay engaged in the battle. Verse 6, so then, let us not sleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be slow, uh, uh, sober. The world without Jesus lives in darkness. Spiritually speaking, they are asleep. But the danger is that believers can sometimes be spiritually asleep. When you're asleep, 
like I trust all of you have experienced some good sleep last night. When you're asleep, you're unaware of what's going on around you. When you're spiritually asleep, it means you are not aware of what God is doing around you. You're not aware of what God's doing in the world. And the Bible tells us in many places to wake up, to wake up. Listen to Romans 13 verse 11. Besides this, you know the time that the hour has come for you to wake from sleep. For salvation, and this salvation is full and final salvation. For salvation is nearer to us than when we first believed. That, that just makes sense with each and every passing day. Salvation, full salvation is closer than it was yesterday. We all know <laughs> that there are morning people and night people. We talked about that last week. My Joanna, she is not a morning person. And some of you, I, I bet you... If we were to be in your presence when you first get out of bed, it would be shocking. Because when I see you, by the time I see you, you're all fully functional, sweet, kind, and considerate. But I bet you some of you, oh, man, you could just, uh, some people are not morning people. Tragically, many believers are not morning people. They're spiritual sleepwalkers. They're intoxicated by the world. And they're yawning their way through life. There are many of you, I hope it's not the case, but many of you may possibly be physically awake. Your eyes are open and you're aware of the people around you. But are you aware of what God's doing? Do you care about what God's doing? We're all familiar with the signs that you sometimes um, can hang on your hotel door. Do not disturb. That tells the cleaning crew, do not disturb. It tells kids running up and down the hallway, do not disturb. Of course, sometimes you might be inviting them <laughs> to disturb. But do not disturb. We, we sometimes put that on our hotel doors. Um, I wonder if any of us have put a do not disturb sign on our heart. As God looks through this gathering, have any of you hung a do not disturb? disturbed sign on your heart. You don't want to get too excited about sharing your faith. You don't want to get too excited about living for Jesus. You're content to have your ticket punched, as it were, to heaven. And you know what? You'd kind of just prefer to just cruise the rest of the way. I believe the unspoken attitude of a whole lot of Christians is, I'm content to come to church, sit, be fed, go home, and just wait until the roll is called up yonder. And in the meantime, Lord, don't, do not disturb. Do not disturb. Is that true of you? If truth be told, deep down. The negative command is don't sleep. And then it's followed by two positive commands. Keep awake and be sober. The first command, be sober, I mean, be awake Keep awake, it emphasizes the need for vigilance. The second one, be sober, conveys the idea of balance or discipline or sober-mindedness. So continuing the metaphors from the previous verse, we have here two activities that people engage in principally at night. Not exclusively, but principally at night, sleeping and getting drunk. Look at verses 7 and 8. For those who sleep, sleep at night. And those who get drunk are drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober. So here, sleeping refers metaphorically to passive indifference. Getting drunk refers metaphorically to active sin. Those who sleep spiritually are in spiritual darkness. Either like those, either like those physically asleep or like a drunk who has no idea of dangers around him. And they will get, get caught by surprise when the day of the Lord begins. Um, so during this age in which we live, those who have not accepted the gospel, they sleep. An allusion to their moral and spiritual indifference. So folks, let me just kind of summarize what Paul's point is here so far. Those who are on the road to ultimate salvation should behave differently from those on the road to destruction. 
if we're day people, as it were, spiritually alive, we know the light of the world, our lives should reflect that. And as I mentioned last week, unfortunately, though, we people who know Christ, we're, we're living the Christian life in flesh that is attracted to the world. We still have a fallen nature that craves the things of the world. And if we're not real careful, we day people can sometimes live like night people. And sometimes Christian people can be as mean as, as a snake. Um, so may, may, may we who know the Lord live life like we know the Lord. What are the consequences when day people... Believers live like night people, unbelievers. I think a number of things happen. Number one, it dishonors the Lord. It grieves his spirit. It damages your testimony. It brings a reproach on Christ. Do you remember David's sin? Isn't it, isn't it a shame that David, a man who early on in life had a heart that beat after God, God said himself, David is a man after my own heart. And then later on, he took his eyes off the Lord. His focus was not where it should have been. He committed adultery with Bathsheba. He made sure that her husband was, was killed in battle. Do you remember the commentary on what David did? The statement that was made? First, I mean, 2 Samuel 12, 14, by this deed, David was told, you have utterly scorned the Lord. You have shown utter contempt for the word of the Lord. You have given occasion to the enemies of God to blaspheme. And that's one of those things that hurts so badly. When one of us, a preacher, a pastor, a layperson, sin in such a way that, man, it, it, people, people know about it. They find out about it. It brings a reproach on Christ. So, you who are of the day live like people of the day. When you don't, it diminishes the attractiveness of the gospel. It distorts the transforming power of the gospel. And it can bring discipline into our lives. We don't want that, do we? No, no one in their right mind wants that. So Christian responses to the day of the Lord. First, stay engaged in the battle. Number two, stay equipped for the battle. Stay equipped for the battle. Middle part of verse 8, 1 Thessalonians 5, 8. Since we belong to the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. We talked about these articles of uh, ancient warfare uh, last week. This breastplate covered the vital organs of a soldier. The helmet covered his head, his brain, his, his center of thinking. And so the ancient breastplate was like a bulletproof vest. The, the helmet of salvation, the, the helmet itself was like a, a football helmet or a motorcycle helmet. We're told here the breastplate is of faith and love. So in this imagery of protecting our vital organs, it's almost like the breastplate has two sides to it. One side is hard. And I mean, it is hard as a rock. And so when arrows come or rocks are thrown, it'll bounce off. That hard part is our faith. Folks, I want you, I want us to have rock hard, rock solid faith in Jesus. Absolute confidence that God is in control, that God is sovereign, that God in his prov providence moves all things in accordance with his will. Don't be moved by your circumstances. Trust in the Lord. Have faith in him. Faith in his person, his power, his promises, and his plan. Um, I, I had prayer with somebody yesterday. They were facing a, a doctor's appointment that they were very, very concerned about. And in the process of just praying, I, I just mentioned, as probably some of you might would do, that the Lord would give this person peace that passes all understanding. And when I said amen, she said, you know what? Somebody else that knows about what this person's going through mentioned the peace of God that passes all understanding. And then today I was following up to find out how the appointment went. And I just sent um, Isaiah 26.3. Um, he, um, um, the Lord will keep in perfect peace those who trust in him. So this, this breastplate 
is faith. It's trust. It's, um, it's a dependency on the Lord to do what he knows is right, what he knows is best, when it might otherwise blow my mind and shatter my dreams and raise questions. Breast, breastplate of faith. But on the other side, it's also a breastplate of faith and love. So I don't want us to have such a rock-solid faith and belief in Jesus that we become hard and crusty kind of people. No. And I think we all know some people like that. That, that preacher I began my sermon illustration with, I, I don't think his breastplate had much love on it. But man, just to love the Lord, to love each other. Um, man, I am so thankful. Now, and I know sometimes pastors can be as naive as the day is long. But I perceive that our church is in a mode where, man, we, we do care for each other genuinely. We love each other. If you, if you, the people that you know, and, and I know it's becoming harder and harder to know everybody, that's one of those blessings of a growing church. But as you, as you do get to know people and then you genuinely love them and care about them, that's the breastplate of love. Um, and then there's this helmet of the hope of salvation. It's not, I'm hoping that I'm saved. I'm not so sure I can trust God's word. I hope, no, 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 no. It's the hope of full and final salvation. I am not right now what I am ultimately going to be, and none of you are either. Some of you are so much more spiritually mature than I am, it makes me envious. But you've not arrived yet either. Our full and final salvation will come once we are either resurrected or glorified get our glorified bodies and then we'll be just like Jesus um, in the meantime your thoughts and emotions need to be governed by the hope of your salvation the full assurance of it so Christian responses to the day of the Lord stay engaged in the battle stay equipped for the battle thirdly stay encouraged in the battle Stay encouraged in the battle. In this world in which we live, there is so much bad news, so many serious problems in our country and around the world. And folks, if we're not real careful, we as Christ followers, Bible believers, can get discouraged, can just really get down in the dumps, maybe sometimes can even border on being depressed. Um, sometimes godly people suffer, and they can be tempted to have their thoughts altered. But here, stay encouraged in the battle. Two thoughts. Number one, encourage yourself with the gospel. Encourage yourself with the gospel. So look at verse 9, the first part of verse 9. For God has not destined us for wrath. Folks, think about how glorious that truth is. For those of us who knew Jesus, we are not destined for wrath. So, um, Carlene and her parents took her brother, their son, back to the airport today. And so he's flying out of the big, massive PGV. And if you're flying out of PGV, you are going to CLT, Charlotte. There's just no other way. We will be raptured through Charlotte. You did know that, right? Okay, so imagine that you are at a bigger airport than PGV. You're at Charlotte, you're at Atlanta, you're at Chicago. I've, and I have actually thought this. Wouldn't it be interesting if you're seeing all these people hustling, bustling, going around, if there was like a sign above their head saying Chicago, Dallas-Fort Worth, San Diego, and you would kind of know where they're going. Um, imagine people in general having a sign on their head saying heaven or hell. Do you ever... Wonder where people are destined as you go through life? There are only two possibilities. And here we are told that as believers, we are not destined for wrath. Listen to John 3.36. It talks about these two opposite destinations. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life but the wrath of God remains on him. And unless a person comes to know Jesus as his or her Savior, they will experience the full-blown wrath of God. Now, folks, I know that for you, 
I'm assuming that for all of you, the concept of eternal condemnation, eternal damnation, while uncomfortable and while we might wish it's not so, we know it's an inescapable truth from the Bible. Listen to Matthew 25, verse 46. And these, in this context, is talking about unbelievers. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Man, aren't you glad you're not destined for God's wrath? And that wrath, by the way, here, it's, it's not just an outburst where God loses his temper and just does something that maybe he later regrets. No, it is a settled emotional response, a settled, appropriate emotional response to sin and wickedness. It, 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 it cannot help but deserve God's wrath. All right, so let's go back to 1 Thessalonians, middle part of verse 9, and then uh, the first part of verse 10. For God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us. Oh, folks, the substitutionary atonement. It's not exactly a, a phrase that you use all that often in everyday conversations, right? But the substitutionary atonement of Christ is one of the most glorious things taught in our scriptures. He who knew no sin became sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Substitutionary atonement. He took our place. Um, do you recall, this was back in, oh, let's, let's see. I don't think I wrote down the date. But it's been a good maybe 10, 12 years ago. It's when those 12 youth soccer players, ages 11 to 16, and their 25-year-old coach were trapped in a cave in northern Thailand. Some of you are nodding your heads. You remember that. They, they, they weren't doing anything wrong. They just thought, you know, they, they had finished soccer practice and probably had been down in those caves before. And so next thing you know, they go. And then all of a sudden, they did not check the weather forecast a deluge came, and it partially flooded that cave, and they couldn't get out. It would take 17 days for them to get out. In the process, a guy, da, 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 a 37-year-old former Royal Thai Navy SEAL, the equivalent of our Navy SEALs, he was working in a volunteer capacity, and he died in an overnight mission in which he was placing oxygen tanks in certain locations that would be needed for those divers who would come get the kids and bring them out. Now, he knew he was taking a risk, but he did not plan to die. He planned to put those oxygen canisters where they needed to be and then go home and spend the night with his wife and his family. That's what he intended. Jesus he planned to die. Before the foundation of the world was laid, Jesus, in the mind of the Godhead, had been slain. Jesus came here knowing the Via Della Rosa would come. And yes, in the Garden of Gethsemane, we hear him praying, Oh God, if there be any way possible. And yet I know it's not. And therefore, nevertheless, your will be done. He planned to die. He planned to die for you. He planned to die for every one of us in this room. He planned to die for every person that would ever live. What privileged people are we? Um, so back to our text, whether we are awake or asleep. Um, oh, I'll tell you what, before, I, before I go there, let me just share. Uh, Jeremy, I know I've skipped a couple things, but just put that John Stott statement up there. He died our death that we might live his life. Man, I think that's a glorious statement. He died our death that we might live his life. All right, middle part of verse 10. Christ died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we might live with him. So praise the Lord Jesus arose. And uh, if he had not, then our faith would be worthless and we'd still be in our sins. But when it says there that, that whether we are awake or asleep, the metaphor here must refer to our physical addition, uh, condition, whether we are alive when Jesus comes or we have died beforehand and not to our moral or spiritual state. That is, the time of our death is irrelevant. 
it will have no bearing on our receiving the fullness of our salvation and eternal life. So when Paul says whether we are awake or asleep, he means it in the sense of 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 13 to 17. Whether we are alive, alive when Christ comes or whether we die before he comes, it doesn't matter. You still get to experience the fullness of your salvation. So stay encouraged in the battle. Encourage yourself with the gospel. And then number two, encourage others with the gospel. Encourage others with the gospel. Verse 11, therefore, encourage one another and build one another up just as you are doing. And this world can be such an unfriendly place. It's easy to get hurt. Bereavement strikes. We can become overwhelmed with the stresses of life, the hardships of living in a sin-cursed world. We can become discouraged, can we not? And all of us have been discouraged. But God means for his church to be a community of mutual support. Notice it says here to, um, to, uh, to comfort one another we're told here in verse 11 to encourage one another. In chapter 4, verse 18, and comfort one another. In chapter 5, verse 11, encourage or comfort one another and build one another up. All three of those are offshoots from the fact that we're to love one another. Uh, one another stresses the reciprocal nature of Christian care. You don't leave it to the professionals. You don't leave it to elite counselors. They have their place. They have their place, and I am thankful that there are people who are so much more skilled with counseling and, and care for people with mental distress than what I am. But guess what? You and I are to be encouraging one another. No community should call itself Christian if it's not characterized by reciprocal love. And yet equally, no community is such a paradise of love that its members do not need to hear Paul urging them to do so more and more. Folks, the people you're sitting beside, the people in front of you, the people behind you, they need encouragement. We all do from time to time. And some of you are extraordinarily good encouragers. Um, just, just this week, I've received a couple of texts in, in particular. I told the people, I said, you've made my day. You have made my day. And some of you, you've had people that maybe today or yesterday or last Thursday, they made your day. It might have been short. It might have been sweet. It might have been simple. But it encouraged you. It lifted your spirit. Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up. That's what the Bible tells us to do. To encourage means continually to strengthen by one's words, verbally or written. Some of you, you do better if you're talking face-to-face, -face, looking at somebody eyeball to eyeball than just saying something. It can be just as simply as, I love you. You know that, right? You know I love you. Man, that can just be encouraging. Some of you, boy, face-to-face, eyeball to eyeball, just kind of gives you, make you break out in hives. But you can sit down and you can articulate it on paper or a card or in an email or in a text. However long the Lord tarries and however dangerous the battle gets and however dire the circumstances, we all need to be encouraging one another and building one another up. Ephesians 4, 29, let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such is good for building up as fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear. Um, several years ago, Idaho businessman Don Bennett he was the first amputee to climb to the summit of Mount Rainier. That's 14,410 feet on one leg and two crutches. During a difficult portion of the climb, Bennett and his team had to cross an ice field. To get across the ice, the climbers had to put spikes on their boots to prevent slipping and to dig into the ice for leverage and stability. Unfortunately, with only one spiked boot and two crutches, the only way Bennett could figure out how to get across the ice field was to lay face forward onto the ice, pull himself as far forward as he possibly could, stand up, and then do it again. 
on this climb, his teenage daughter Kathy happened to be with him, and she stayed by her, her dad's side through the entire four-hour struggle and kept shouting in his ear, you can do it, Dad. You're the best dad in the world. You can do it, Dad. And don't you know that he just kept right on. You're the best dad ever. Can you imagine how encouraging that was to him? Kathy's belief in and verbal encouragement of her father gave him the resolve that he needed to keep on keeping on. And so, folks, some of you might say something today. You might write something tomorrow, and it will be such an encouragement to somebody. It might help them keep on keeping on, climbing, running the race, pursuing Jesus. Let's do that. Father, would you help us? I ask, Lord, that, uh, well, first, I want to thank you and praise you that we who know Christ are not destined for wrath. Sometimes you're disappointed in us. Sometimes you have to chastise us because we fall into sin. Our flesh is weak. We fail to pray like we should, and we yield to temptation. Oh, but, Lord, your full wrath is not our destination. And I thank you and praise you for amazing grace and deep, rich mercy, which makes forgiveness and salvation possible. Lord, you've told us ahead of time the day of the Lord is coming. And it will be a day, a period of time filled with extraordinary events, some of which the world has never even come close to experiencing. And I pray that you'll help us between now and the commencement of that day to be people of light to be people who keep their breastplate of faith and love up and on and who keep the helmet of the hope of our salvation in place. And Lord, help us to be an encouragement to somebody, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen.